I'm Paul Baudet from the Religious Studies Department, and um, it's my privilege this morning to present, or if you were here last evening to hear her, to represent Sister Paula Gonzalez, um, who will be speaking this morning in the second of the Seton Lectures. Paula is a futurist, educator, and environmentalist at the College of St. Joseph in Cincinnati. She's a founder of Earth Connection, a center for learning and reflection about living lightly on the earth. And she's a member of the Sisters of Charity, the sisters who have founded this university and who are still around, um, that live at the Mother House and still uh, teach and minister in many ways in the local community. Um, when I asked Paula how she'd like to be introduced, she said briefly, so I'll honor that request. And just to say one more thing that the, um, the topic of her uh, lecture this morning is changes for the new millennium, choice or catastrophe. And it's my understanding that in the course of this, she's going to tell you a story about a tomato. I'm not going to tell you a story about a tomato, but you have been given a handout, I believe, or they are circulating. That's your homework. I'm basically an old teacher, so I always give homework. And uh, we're not going to deal with that, but in that article about the tomato, an industrial metaphor, you will get a summary of pretty much what this lecture is about, which is looking at the fact that at the present time, from an environmental perspective, we still have choices. The number of choices that we have become smaller every day that we let pass. We have options about what we might be able to do about our planet. I come, as I said last night to those of you who may have been here, this is the star of this lecture series. I am the humble spokesperson of our planet, badly damaged planet at this point, rather in a state of radical transformation, like it or not, and uh, a planet that will not look like this and will not sustain life, human life, much beyond the end of the next century unless we radically change the industrial model. Not only the industrial model, but the industrial attitude. I don't know if you realize it or not, but the posture of industrialism is essentially arrogance. Would you agree? Arrogance. It's, we will move that mountain, we will rechannel that river, we will do whatever we please with the earth and the air and the water. And we will kill ourselves in the process. We won't kill the planet. Planet will be around, it was around for eons before we arrived. We are one of the most recent additions, we humans, one of the most recent additions to the planet. We have to understand that. We are not the top of the heap. We are one among many in what should be a community. The, the sacred earth community as Thomas Berry calls it. And uh, we have to learn our role. We have to reassess where do humans fit appropriately into this scheme. Up to now, we have taken very seriously and misinterpreted from Genesis that we are supposed to have dominion, which has been interpreted as domination, which is very different from dominion, scripturally speaking. And so we have dominated. And we are about to dominate ourselves into oblivion. So this is the choice that we talk about here today. When I say choice or catastrophe, I mean we are going to have massive changes on this planet. And what kind they are will be determined by whether or not we make a choice toward change or we simply wait until the ecological catastrophes do it for us. Many of us in this audience, especially the younger people, will definitely live to see this change, this decision. So I'll start out with a choice right away. You don't have to bother with the title. The title's not important. The picture is important. Look at that meditatively. You remember, this spirit series is a series on eco-spirituality. And we're talking here about how do we connect science 
and faith. Because that's basically what we're talking about when we talk about eco-spirituality. How do we let our faith color our scientific endeavors? And how do we let, more importantly at this point, because it hasn't been done, how do we let what science has learned, especially over the last hundred years, how do we let that inform and expand our faith understanding? Spirituality is a very difficult thing to define. In fact, there are 25 definitions. But the one that I like the best, it comes from our native peoples in the US, and I'm sure would be similar to your Aboriginal people's understanding of this. Spirituality is a way of life. Integrating all of your being into a way of life that is appropriate. The Tao. In Christian thought, perhaps, the way, the truth, and the life. We know what that's all about, but we don't think about it a whole lot. It's the integrated posture within which you find yourself in the universe. That's spirituality, in my understanding. It's, it's whatever it takes to make you completely who you can be. That's a deeply, deeply spiritual concept. And uh, so what do we want to do here? We want to ask you, how many in here would prefer in the future for yourselves and your children this world that you see over here on this side? Raise your hands, nice and high. How many, I'm not going to make any assumptions, how many would prefer a world that looked a little bit more like the one on the right? Raise your hands. Okay. The choice is right exactly where you've just put it in your hands. Notice one of the major differences is in the middle of the drawing. Will we continue to let the digital watch with the beeper run our lives, or will we want again to return to the harmony of knowing when it's night and day by looking outside? difficult to do with the way we've learned to build things. As you know, if we were trapped in this room, it would be difficult to know that we lived in a magnificent world, which today is absolutely spectacular, of wonderful cool air and breezes and beautiful green and red and orange trees and little squirrels da dashing by. We would not know that. We would be in this rather ugly, it's a beautiful auditorium, but I wouldn't want to spend the rest of my life in here, would you? We'd have no water, we have no sun, nothing green. Unless someone has on a green outfit, that's the only thing we would know. There's a woman with green slacks and a lady up there with a green sweater. That's the only memory we would have of life on this planet because life does not occur on this planet unless it starts out green. So we're going to look at this and that's why this appeals to us because it calls to the deep spirit of each of us that says, hey, that's home. This is not home, folks. And most of us know it, but we don't have the courage to tell each other that it's not home. And consequently, we want to get back home. And that's basically what we're talking about here, is a re-inhabiting of the planet with our whole heart and our whole soul and our whole mind, realizing the wonder of living on this unbelievable planet. So I will open today's lecture with a little meditation. I ask you to meditate. I'm using that word purposely. I want you to meditate on this cartoon with a special emphasis on the word lease and the word day. Think about in the context of this picture, what, 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 are, what does that mean? We're going to explore this a little this morning. Here's this little man reaching into his mailbox and he gets a threat to not renew humanity's lease on the planet. And he's, his immediate reaction, but well, they can't do that to us, can they? Two questions. Who's day? Point today. Point today. You can do it this way, but the best way to do it is this way. Here's they. They can't do that to us, can they? We are doing it. We're doing it all the time, every day. What about lease? Do we lease the planet? 
Did you ever think about that? How many think we own the planet? Raise your hand. How many think we lease it? Come on, raise your hands. We lease it, okay? Quite a few leasees. How many think we borrow it? How many haven't ever thought about it? <laughs> How many of you ever thought about what relationship you have to this planet? How many of you have ever actually thought about what is my relationship to this planet? Some of you, yes. I'm glad to hear that. That's good. That's why you're at this lecture. And then there's millions of people out there who never thought about it. What is our relationship? And this is where the deep, the depth of the spirituality comes in. Because we do not lease this planet. If you want to make sure that that's true, let's all do an exercise. Everybody take the absolutely deepest breath you can take. Ah, oh, doesn't that feel good? Mm. Can you have another one? Can you have another deep breath? How many deep breaths can you have? Up to a certain point someplace, which we don't know, mystery, as many as you want, right? And while you're doing that, look over your shoulder. See anybody back there? Bill collectors of any kind? Any bill collectors? Have you, no? Do we have to pay? Lease suggests what? Pay. Never pay. It's on loan, folks. It's on loan from the great eternal creator, on loan to us. Let me ask you this. For American audiences, I always get 100% response. I have a feeling that border doesn't mean anything in terms of humans. How, what were you taught when you were a child about how you should treat something that you borrowed from a, one of your friends? How should you treat it? Would you, as if it's your own or what? Better. How many were actually taught you should actually take better care of it than if it were your very own because it belongs to someone else? Raise your hand. It's a universal world. Everybody knows they were taught take better care of it. Does that say anything to you if we understand that our relationship to this is borrowed for a time? What should it mean? We should take better care of it than if it were ours. We should what? Love it. We should understand that it is totally sacred. It belongs to the great eternal one. It is a sacred, it is holy ground. Every bit of air we breathe, every little drink of water we take is holy water, holy air, holy food. We are constantly at, you, at the Eucharistic table. Three meals a day and a lot of snacks in between are all Eucharist. If we become sacralized in our minds, if we understand that everything is sacred, everything is made in the image and likeness of God. Everything says something different about God. Think of what our vision of God becomes. Much bigger. For a very long time we have made God in our own image and likeness, folks, instead of the other way around. And so we have to learn from this our appropriate role. Elizabeth Johnson, who is an eco-feminist theologian who teaches at uh, Fordham, writes the following relationships. She says there are three possible relationships between humans and the planet. Kingship, which is of course the relationship that we have been using. You know, humans are up here at the top of the creation and all the rest of this is just stuff, okay? Stewardship, yes? which is what? Responsible, caring uh, about the planet. But she says that is not yet the appropriate, the appropriate relationship. Because what is the shape of, if you think of it in shapes, of kingship? Looks like this, doesn't it? Here's the king, or here's the humans, and here's everything else below them. Not as important. Stewardship looks just like this except that we're nice. You follow? We're nice. We're responsible. We're willing to do something. That is still not the appropriate relationship. Knock this pyramid down to flat and make it round like a table. This is a very Christian concept. Make it round like a table and what do you have? You have kinship. We have to come to understand, and this is scientifically accurate, by the way, we are kin 
of absolutely everything that exists. What are you made out of? Right now, I'm being made out of French toast, syrup, butter, coffee. They are becoming me, aren't they? Some of you are made out of Cheerios, Wheaties, cornflakes, sausage. Whatever you ate for breakfast is no longer what it was. It is now you, as we well know sometimes, that becomes very much part of us. So kinship. Do you realize that you have in your genetic material, in your DNA, you have a whole lot of genes that are identical to the genes in a chrysanthemum? Did you know that? You're related to chrysanthemums. They've been around a lot longer than we have, by the way. Another way to think of that relationship, too, is we have only been on this planet, we humans, for a very, very minute length of time. If you take all of creation, 15 or 20 billion years, and put it into one year, guess when modern humans would be arriving? On the 31st of December at 11, 59.59. We have been here one second out of the cosmic year. Now, that should tell us something, too. If we are so young, then we should learn from our elders. And who are our elders? Everything. Everything is our elder. Think about that. So what do we have to look at today? We have to look at how we relate to the world from the point of view of environmental impact. We have to start reassessing our relationship with the world from the point of view of how much does it cost the planet to keep me alive in the style to which I have become accustomed? How do we learn to do planetary cost accounting and start to ask ourselves, how much do I cost the planet? And to do that, we have to look at what environmental impact means. And it's a fairly simple concept. It's related to the number of people and the number of units of resources that each person uses and the environmental impact of each unit of these materials that we use. The combination of these multiplied together gives you environmental impact. Does that make sense? So we have to look at how many people are there and what are they using. Do we belong to what is now called the consumer society? Unfortunately, the global consumer society, the global marketplace, which the planet absolutely cannot afford? Yes, we do. But we're going to have to change that. Let's see how our brothers and sisters throughout the world are arranged. There are two, two, two situations. About 75% of the Earth's people live in fairly large families, have large families of children, but each one of them uses very little. However, since there are a large number of them, each one of them doesn't make much of an environmental impact, but the total impact is very large because there's a very large number of people. On the other hand, that's the third world, so-called. And then in the first world, we have a slightly different situation. We have about a fourth of the people of the Earth who have fairly small families, but each member of the family uses an unbelievably large amount of materials. Therefore, the environmental impact of each person is gigantic, what one might call the ecological footprint. Think about that, how you plop your foot on the earth. And you get a similar or larger environmental impact. 25% of the people here have at least as great, if not greater, an environmental impact than 75% of the people do here. The social justice issue there we could spend the whole rest of the day on, and especially for us as Christians, that's a very important thing. If we're really going to be Christians in the 21st century, we have to look at this reality because it's not fair, and it should not be there, and we should see what we can do about it. We have to look then at two things, people and consumption. Let's look first at people. Most people, and in Catholic circles, this is, of course, a touchy subject because 
the official church doesn't want to talk about population. Well, I'm not part of the official church, so I have to talk about it because I'm a biologist, and knowing the rules of ecology, I know that it's imperative that we talk about it. I want you to see two things. One of them is this. Here we are in 19, almost 2000. This is billions of people. And I want you to really get this. I mean, I know a lot of people's eyes glaze over when they see graphs, like, oh, oh, no, I don't want to look. Please, I beg you, as a religious exercise, if you want to think of it as the ascetical aspect of eco-spirituality, all spiritual paths have asceticism, do they not? The asceticism here may well be facing the facts. OK, we have 6 billion people right here. What I want you to notice, this block here is the lifetime of a child born today. It represents about 72 years. And what this graph is telling you is that at present rates of population growth, this child will die at the age of 72 in a world with nearly 30 billion people. Now, what's important to understand about that is that the amount of land surface which is presently where we live more comfortably than if we had to move out here, is not going to increase. As a matter of fact, it's decreasing. Now, I want you just to ponder that reality. Here's this little girl who's about three. By the time this little girl is 72 years old, 75 years old, there will be five times as many people on this planet as there are now. Five Halifaxes, five Torontos, five, five Ottawas, five Edmontons, five Vancouvers, five New York Cities, five Mexico Cities, five Tokyos. Is it possible? Absolutely not. It's not possible. Consequently, what does that suggest? The rate of population growth absolutely has to diminish. It will diminish, either by choice or by famine. This will level out one way or another. Somehow it seems more human to me that it level out by choice. I don't want to get into that whole thing, because that's a huge, enormous topic. But it's got to be clear that it's not possible in two generations to add you know, 24 billion people. It's just not possible. And while we're at it, I'll throw this in quickly because some people get very nervous about, oh, what, what, well, what are we going to do, especially Catholics? Uh, let's look and see. We are very clever people. We're smart. God gave us amazing intelligence. You don't have to go about making that line flatten out by taking helicopters and raining condoms on all the villages of the third world. Do you see? That is not necessarily the way you go, have to go about this. That's very violent. It is not in keeping with many people's both cultural and religious traditions, and it would not work. They found that out in India, where they were paying uh, men especially to be sterilized, and boy, it didn't last long. Indira Gandhi lost her job over that because it was so contrary to their culture. And so look at this fascinating thing. These are very poor countries, Pakistan, Thailand, Colombia, Egypt, Kenya. These are poor countries. Look at what has been done, and this is recent in the last 10, 15 years, because they had leadership in their governments that was really intelligent and understood something, a relationship between education and family size. They thought, gee, if those girls are in school, I bet you they're not going to have as many children. And by the darn, they don't. Take a look at this. What you're looking at here is no education. In Pakistan, women who have no education average nearly six children. The ones that have primary education average about five. And the ones that have secondary education average about three and a half. Interesting, huh? Look at the next one. Thailand has gone from three and a half to two and a half to 1.7. We welcome a class that's coming in the middle here. The teacher asked me to, uh, to let them in, so we will. Uh, 
Colombia, notice Colombia. Those, those up there are, are Oriental nations with different religious backgrounds. But look at Colombia, smack in the middle of South America, probably nearly 100% Catholic. And what have they done? 4.9 to 3.6 to 2.3. Zero population growth, folks, is 2.1. What does zero population growth mean? It doesn't mean that no one's being born. It means that a couple has two children, which means that what? When they die, there will be two people. That's what you mean by zero population growth, is that, that two people replace themselves. And so we have, to, we have to look at that. There are many ways that we can look at working on this problem, other than letting people starve to death. But speaking of starving to death, we have to look at something else very, very seriously. This graph looks a lot like the last one I showed you, but it's not the same. This is the let, come on in. Are you part of this class? There's loads of seats right here. In the, you get the best seats. Come late and get the best seats. How's that? Um, let's look at this because we have to look and see the land needed to feed the growing population. Would you, would you agree that there's a definite relationship between how many people you can have somewhere and how much food you can grow? Everybody understand that relationship? Very, very simple. Take a look at this picture. Here is the total potentially arable land in the world. That's how much there is, about 3.3 3 billion hectares. That's how much there is actually that you can farm, that you can grow food on. And what's interesting is that since about here someplace, since we started modern agriculture, guess what you got? You have less land than you used to. Can everyone see the amount of land going down constantly by erosion? the destruction of it by industrial agricultural practices, you will read more about them in that tomato essay that I gave you. And it'll, it'll scare you to realize what we've been doing. But we are losing land. Look at the amount of land that would be lost by 2200 if we continue our agricultural practices as they presently are. So what do we have to do? For one thing, we've got to change how we do agriculture because we're destroying the very land on which we need to grow food. But look at this. This is very sobering. Here's the amount of land that it takes right now to feed the six billion people that we presently have. If you notice, if the population continues at the rate we looked at on that last graph, the amount of land needed to grow food, when this fellow here is about 45 or 50 years old, those two lines will cross. And that means that the total potentially arable land will be less than we need to grow what looks like it could be an increasing amount of people. What does that word say there? Impossible. When is this? 45 years from now? We're not talking about something in the far distant future, folks. We're talking about now. And when I say choice or catastrophe, can you see what I mean? Let's look just a little bit more then at something that most of us are totally oblivious of. Here, here are the kinds of land on earth. We have to look at this earth that the Lord has loaned us to use. Isn't that an amazing fact? Agriculturally speaking, only 3% of the earth's land surface is highly productive. Three. Wow. 6% is somewhat productive. You've got to work a lot harder to get food out of that. And about 13% <clears throat> is slightly productive. If you add that up, you will find that of the Earth's surface, which is only about 75% about land, only what? A rather small amount, about a quarter of it is productive, agriculturally speaking. In other words, that's the only place you can raise food. Well, what's wrong with the rest of it, you say? Well, it's pretty easy to see. Too cold, too dry, you with me? It, it, there's just a few places where the, where the climate is appropriate for growing food and the soil. So what do we have? 25% of the Earth's surface is too cold to raise anything. Too dry or too steep? Deserts, mountains. Too wet? Swamps. You can grow rice. You can grow some things in some of these places. 
but the, but, but the, the amount of arable land utilizing the methods of agriculture that we've been using since humans have been around are very, very limited. Every day, more of them is used for paving, highways, parking lots. Yes, some of the best arable land in North America is covered with blacktop. And North America has some of the best arable land in the world. Of that 3% highly productive, we have most of it in North America. So we have to look. Okay, let's bring this home then to ourselves. How am I related to that graph? How does my lifestyle affect that graph? Let's look at this. These are the processes and causes of land degradation. Most of us know these, but we don't think about them because we don't think that we have any part to play in them happening. Water erosion, bunches. What happens to tons and tons, several billion tons of topsoil a year are washed into the oceans because of our agricultural methods? Several billion tons. That's a lot of land. Wind erosion. Wind erosion is less common uh, in the temperate regions as it is in the desert areas. But water erosion is super big. Wind erosion is big, though, if you cut down the plants. Like in forest areas, you start to get wind erosion. If you clear cut 80 acres, you get wind erosion now, and you get mudslides. Chemical degradation. How does that happen? We have to spray our lawns with all that stuff that keep them absolutely perfect. And then, of course, all the agricultural chemicals that are utilized, which you will read more about in that tomato article. Physical degradation. How do we do that? Well, there's things called mines. There are drilling. There's all sorts of ways in which the surface of the earth is punctured and scarred and mutilated. A mine is like taking a big, if you think about the earth as a single living organism. The Gaia theory, which we don't have time to look at today, suggests that the, actually the entire Earth may well be a single unified living entity. Now that's kind of interesting, which means then if you drill a well, it's like sticking a nail or, or a big hole in yourself. Or if you do strip mining. Have you ever had one of those really, really bad floor burns where all the top skin comes off and you've got all this ooze coming out? That's what a strip mine looks like. So the Earth is, is, uh, probably hurts a lot when that happens. Now, what are the causes? Why do these things happen? And see if you can relate to these your own life. Overgrazing is by far the largest. Do you have any relationship to overgrazing of property, of land? Who can tell me what overgrazing of land is, how that's related to your personal life? What's that? Hamburgers. Hamburgers and other similar fast foods. Do you know that the tropical forests in Central America are being decimated right now by the fast food companies in order to raise cattle? And the drastic and terrible part about that, because we're not good ecologists, is I don't know if you know this or not. Many people would think that tropical forests would have really rich soil, right? I mean, you, you, you think, gee, they're such rich, lush thing. They don't. Soil is terrible. Because in the tropical forest, you have four layers of forest. And all of the decomposition that goes on in the earth, you know, when the leaves fall around here, etc., all of that returns to the earth. And so you have nice, rich soil. All that decomposition in the tropical forest takes place in the air, in the levels, before it hits the ground. The soil is very poor. Three years of grazing on what used to be a tropical forest and that's all the cows you can raise on that pasture. At that point, what does it become? A desert. A desert. Every year on the face of this planet, a desert approximately the size of Delaware and Maine. I don't know it in, in, in uh, Canadian equivalents, but you all know Maine is a big state in Delaware. That much of the earth every year becomes a desert. Now, I think you know deserts don't support human life real well, or any other kind for that matter. Secondly, deforestation. Anybody in here related to deforestation? I'm in an academic institution. I know you're related to deforestation. Paper is just unbelievable. We, we print newspapers that it takes 
thousands of acres a week to print the, the large uh, Sunday newspapers of the North American and European world. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of trees. And what happens to most of that Sunday paper? Doesn't even look, you don't even look at it. That whole ad section, you just pull it out and put it over here somewhere. And then the next day, it gets taken away and sometimes just thrown away, sometimes burned, which is not a very good idea either. So we have to start looking at those habits. Agricultural activities. How many of you are involved in some way personally with agricultural activities? Come in, there's plenty of seats right here. Agricultural activities. How many of you are related directly to agricultural activities? Anybody in here eat? How many eat? <laughs> Everybody who eats, raise your hand. Are you related to agricultural activities? Absolutely. And the choices that are made for how your agricultural products get to you are personal choices which have to, we have to start thinking of as moral choices. We have to start adding a moral dimension to our shopping. Then we will begin to become adult Christians, adult Hindus, adult Buddhists, adult whatever. People responsible, ecologically responsible believers. Others, uh, oh, I'm sorry, over-exploitation. Read what? Parking lots, malls, highways, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Other, I don't know what other is. By that time, any other way we've figured out to destroy the Earth. But no, notice at the bottom here, the world's long-term ability to meet the growing demand for food and other agricultural products is uncertain. Now read that carefully, because if that says that it's uncertain, it also says that the ability to feed the human race is uncertain. That's never been true before. I mean, we never realized it. But we never had populations that we are now having in the, in the, with, with the speed with which they are growing, never had before. So we have to be very alert. What else is, is true about this that I think is really important for us to see? Another whole aspect of environmental concern is the use of energy. I don't know if you realize it or not, but it is our use of energy that produces most of the pollution of water, air, and soil, is it not? We want to drive our car all by ourselves to somewhere, so we need gasoline, so they have to go and make you know, oil wells and do all that refining and then track the gasoline back and forth in trucks and ships. It's, do you follow the connection there? Every time you turn on your car, you are impacting the entire global ecological reality. Each time each one of us does that, each one of us is impacting the entire global ecology. So the choices we make, what size cars? whether or not we keep our catalytic combustor connected or not, whether or not we have our car serviced, whether we check our tires so that the uh, pressure is right so that you can get a little more mileage out of each, etc. These, these are all habits we need to form and they are also, if we think about it, can become acts of worship. Can become a prayer to go out and check your tires. That ever occur to you? Now, to me, a, spiritual, a spirituality that would include when you go through the supermarket aisle and you reject something that's got double packaging in favor of something that comes bulk, that if you are conscious of it, that can be a prayer. And I don't know about you, but that's the kind of prayer that appeals to me. I'm not a very pious type person. But I pray a lot through that kind of prayer go out and check your tires and then go down to the station and get them blown up to the appropriate and best and most efficient pressure. Change a light bulb from an from a, uh, incandescent light to a fluorescent light. That can be an act of worship. Now that makes religion or spirituality or connection with God, however different people understand that, makes it constant. So one becomes contemplative. Eco-spirituality is deeply contemplative spirituality because everything is sacred, therefore every interaction is sacred. Which means that you're always in the presence of God, if you want to think of it that way, and you know it. Okay, I want to show you this total energy production for U.S. corn pr production, the total energy necessary for U.S. corn production. Notice this, this is startling. Back in 1700, 1800, 1900, notice it was just flat, the same amount. What did you have? Horses out there plowing and harvesting, etc., and harvested by hand, and you didn't get a whole lot of corn. 
Mechanization, look what happened. As soon as you put in mechanization, one man could raise three or four times as much food. Do you follow? But what did that mechanization need? Gasoline, oil. And then the green revolution and new kinds of seed and fertilizers, artificial fertilizers and artificial pesticides and bingo. Guess what you end up with? Before the lifetime of this child, you already have this usage of energy for every hectare of land, for every, I think this is in kilocalories, um, the number of kilocalories that you can raise per hectare has gone straight up. Now, this is extremely expensive to the planet because what it means is that machinery is now using 10% or so of the total energy needed. Draft animals, zero. You have no draft animals, you have no manure. You have no manure, what do you have to use? Artificial petroleum-based fertilizers. Do you follow the connections of how unwise choices we have made in the last 50 years in terms of agriculture? Very unwise choices. If you have draft animals, you have manure. If you have manure, you've got fertilizer. If you have fertilizer, you have plants. And so it's very, very simple. Take a look at these. These are kind of interesting. You, you have fuel here, uh, uses up about 10%. There's no manure. Look at the fertilizers. Remember that these are all petroleum-based, or most of them are petroleum-based. You have like 38% of the energy involved in farming goes into the manufacture and, and uh, use of fertilizers. So not only are they polluting the water and the soil, but they use an enormous amount of energy, which is also polluting the water and the soil. So there's a multiplier effect there. Uh, irrigation, irrigating the plants, you see, is using 21% of the energy. So it's very, very expensive to the planet for you and me to eat, because this is the method we have devised for eating. So we have to look at that. We have to realize, too, that we have been doing really interesting things, not very good things. If you'll notice here in 1945, this is the number of man-made chemicals that there were in the world. Now, most many people in here were not around in 1945. I was young. This is the end of the Second World War. To give you some idea of what happened after the war, when all of the war activity was made into civilian research, and bingo, we started making if you notice, we went from here you are at like 10,000 chemicals to 100,000 chemicals in 10 years. Dow, DuPont, all the big chemical companies got booming during this period, making things that really in many cases people don't need at all, and many of which are damaging. Within 10 more years, what did you have? 500,000. Within 10 more years, what did you have? A million. These are man-made chemicals, which means they do not occur in nature. Consequently, what do you suppose the natural reaction of animals and humans to these foreign chemicals might be? Your bodies are marvelous. They react against foreign materials, generally in one of two or three ways. They secrete more. Any of you have watery eyes? during certain times of the year, and uh, various kinds of rashes. Rashes are common, and of course, tumors. The body protects itself against foreign materials by encapsulating cells that have begun to go crazy, called cancer cells, making them into tumors. All of, many of these eco-diseases come from the fact that we got really smart. In addition to that, we have some really terrible problems because many of these things have to be disposed of. And where do you put things that you're going to dispose of on this planet? So you don't have a lot of choices. You bury them, or you dump them in the river, or you dump them directly in the ocean, or you let them go into the air, right? Now, what do you use for living? Do you drink water? Do you eat food that's grown in the soil? Do you breathe air? Guess what, folks? All those wonderful chemicals we've invented have three or four different ways to get into your body. And if you look at this, you'll see the amount of hazardous waste. I'm sorry to say that my country is leading in this regard, right there. Here is all of Europe, Western and Eastern, and the whole rest of the world, if you put them together, only come to here. We are, without doubt, the 
world's giant dump. And those are, those are ruining our water and our soil. So what does all this mean? Well, it means that we have to th rethink how we do our agricultural task. And that's related, of course, in a very direct way to our daily habits, for example, of eating. Let's ask ourselves something then. This, these are US figures. I don't have Canadian figures <coughs> specifically, but I know that they're extremely similar. The number of pounds of grain and soybeans that are needed to raise one pound of edible food from, to raise one pound of beef takes 16 pounds of grain. 12 to 16, you will see this figure differently. I've seen 12 and 14 and 16, but it's up in that ballpark somewhere. To raise a pig, six pounds of grain. To raise one pound of pork, four pounds to raise a turkey, three pounds to get chickens and eggs. So eating meat, eating animal protein, is a tremendous drain on the, on the land. Because in the US, and I have a feeling since your agriculture up here is very similar to ours, 64% of the cropland, of that wonderful, wonderful land that we have, is given over to livestock feed. 2% to growing fruits and vegetables. 2% of that huge growing area in the US goes into fruits and vegetables. That's mind boggling, folks. So let's look at something that we, we can see here and see how, how we're not very smart. The amount of, of uh, nutrient that's wasted by cycling grain through livestock, because that's what you're doing if you eat meat and milk and eggs, you're actually just passing grain through a, through a machine, through a thing that, that uses it up. Uh, nearly 90% of the protein to 99% of the carbohydrate and all the fiber is just lost. All of these things we need in our diet. And many people in the, in the rich countries are, are uh, deficient in these areas. The amount of corn grown in the United States consumed by humans is 20%. The amount consumed by livestock is 80%. Think about what that means to the land that's growing all that corn. 